This afternoon, Dr. Gary Hoff is going to speak to us, uh, and he is going to speak to us about DMU has presidents past and a brief history of those presidents. Um, we do have at least uh, two DMU presidents on campus today. I, I have seen Dr. Ryan, and of course, Dr. Franklin is here, and so they they both may be coming into the, the uh, lecture at some point. If you didn't get a chance to sign in, uh, there are sign-in sheets uh, at, at either end down here in front, uh, and there's beverages if you want one. Um, Dr. Ha graduated uh, from Oklahoma State University, uh, got his undergraduate degree there. He went into the Air Force for, uh, I believe, about five years and then went back to uh, Oklahoma State. Uh, I'm sorry about that, Gary, uh, but got his DO degree there. Um, he then trained in Chicago in internal medicine and in 1982 came to Des Moines uh, and uh, established faculty ship here at DMU at the same time uh, he was establishing his uh, practice here in Des Moines. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ha, and uh, he will tell us about some of DMU's history. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gray. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be asked to speak in this series of talks celebrating the inauguration of our 15th president. Des Moines University, as a university by that name, uh, has a history of about 12 years. But... This institution, as an institution of higher learning, of health sciences, has a 113-year history. And so, and has had a number of presidents in our, uh, I guess you would call them our predecessor, or our grandmother institutions. So today, after thought, I was asked to give something about the history of the university it occurred to me that we had never really done a discussion of the presidents who have made such a contribution to the success of this institution in years past. So I thought perhaps that would be a good way to begin. However, you have to understand that before I can talk about Des Moines University or our predecessor university, the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences, try to say that really fast, um, or other institutions, you really have to go all the way back to the roots of the osteopathic profession, which is where this university actually came from. So bear with me. I have to give you a little bit of what for some may sound like ancient history from the mid-19th century regarding osteopathy and Andrew Taylor Still. Here he is. Dr. Andrew Taylor Still, affectionately known during his lifetime and during much of the 20th century as the old doctor. And Andrew Taylor Still was a, uh, an original and it sounds uh, like an exceptionally unusual person. First of all, his background was such that <clears throat> he was born in southwest Virginia to uh, a father who was a Methodist minister and circuit rider, and his uh, father, Abram Still, not only was a Methodist minister and circuit rider, but like many Methodist um, clergymen of those days, also provided health care to the people in his district. So, it seems pretty clear that Andrew Still and his two brothers, James and Edward, James was older, Edward was younger, um, <clears throat> probably learned a lot of their medicine by precept from their father. That's not unusual in the 19th century. In fact, in this country, by far, 
I would say 85% of the physicians in North America at that time were trained that way. Very few went to medical schools. Medical schools did exist. There's no doubt about that. And they existed all around, but there, were, there was no, um, no real limit that uh, said that you had to go to school to become a doctor. You could be trained as, a, as an apprentice. You went and sat in a doctor's office and you, quote, read medicine with them. So he read medicine, doubtless, with his father. But he trained otherwise, and I'll talk about that in a minute. His family, staunch Methodists, were strong abolitionists in the pre-Civil War era. Absolutely, categorically opposed to slavery, willing to die to oppose slavery. They were also teetotalers. Methodists in those days just didn't drink alcohol, period. Uh, not good Methodist, anyway. <laughs> I'm sure there were some who did, you know. But So he's an abolitionist, a teetotaler, and during, when the Civil War broke out, he joined the Kansas militia. Now, <clears throat> records differ as to whether he functioned as a regimental surgeon, which he said he did, or as a hospital steward. But in his autobiography, he still said that functioning uh, as a hospital or a regimental surgeon that his bag contained opium or morphine, calomel, whiskey, a knife, and some rags. That's it. That was what he had in his bag, and that's what most surgeons had in their bag. His experience in the Civil War, serving and doing surgery on people who were wounded, he found utterly disgusting. He thought that there had to be a better way <laughs> to take care of people. Furthermore, his Methodist background suggested to him that the drugs of the day were probably not so good, given that most of them were based in alcohol. Most of them were tinctures of alcoholic uh, drugs, like I know you've probably heard of laudanum. Okay? Laudanum is opium dissolved in alcohol, basically. Uh, there used to be a a very, very bad, bad problem with laudanum addiction in the 19th century. Well, the tipping point for A.T. Still came in 1864. In 1864, three of his children died within a few days of one another of spinal meningitis. He says in his autobiography that he was, uh, he was just appalled. He consulted every physician in the area where he lived, eastern Kansas, uh, near what's now called Shawnee Mission, Kansas. And despite the best efforts of every physician in the area that he could contact, these children died. And he was devastated by this. His autobiography says that he thought of quitting medicine. He didn't just think about it, he did. If you look back at the census from 1865 in Kansas, you can find Andrew Taylor still listed and his occupation is listed as farmer. In 1870, when he had recovered from the shock of the death of his children and from the trauma of service during the Civil War, in 1870, the U.S. Census lists A.T. Still as physician. Somewhere in there, in those five years, he recovered from that dreadful experience of his children's death and the Civil War medicine but he was still disgusted with the status of 19th century medicine at that time. So, he had begun studying medicine probably in the early 1850s with his father. He tried to continue study on his own, and in his autobiography he says that he attended a medical school in Kansas City briefly, but their uh, curriculum was so awful he quit. In any event... He studied independently for a long time. He was skeptical of what was called heroic medicine in those days and the toxic drugs. Calomel, by the way, has mercury in it. If you take enough of that, you get mercury poisoning. And he tells in his autobiography how he was treated with that until he, he had some tooth loosening and actually lost a tooth or two. They used to give you that stuff until you salivated so you began to drool. That's how they knew they'd given you enough. And it caused your tooth to fall out and other things, bad things to happen to you. 
He was influenced also by alternative healing systems, which he began to explore because he was disgusted with allopathic or traditional medicine. He was definitely influenced by mesmerism. Today we call that hypnotism, but that's a completely different thing. In those days, mesmerism was also uh, given the term magnetic healing. So he did some, quote, magnetic healing in the uh, late 1860s, early 1870s, all the time thinking these drugs are bad. What can we do to make people better? And he began to think about the mechanics of the body. And he began, he says, to look at the body as a series of levers and wheels and pinions. And he began to think about anatomy and about disordered anatomy and about disease. And he says that he flung to the breeze, this is a quote, flung to the breeze the banner of osteopathy in 1874. Well, he flung some banner to the air, but it didn't have osteopathy on it because that word wasn't even invented for ten more years. He never started using that word until the mid-1880s. But certainly the system was in place in his mind, at least at that time. He got to be so well-known for what he did, not just well-known in northern Missouri, around Kirksville, where he lived, but nationally. He was so well-known for his abundant, apparently abundant successes, that in Kirksville, more railroad train um, arrivals were scheduled just so that the patients who were coming to see the old doctor could be accommodated. There were actually new hotels built in Kirksville because of his enormous success and the big patient base that he had built up. And that becomes important when we talk about our college in a minute or two. Notice here his business card from the mid-1880s. It says, Dr. A.T. Still, Lightning Bone Setter. Okay? And that was his card in those days. But <clears throat> as he got older, and by the late 1880s, he was, a, he was over 60 uh, people began to say to him, Dr. Still, what are we going to do? Uh, nobody knows how to do what you do. Are you going to teach anybody how to do this? Uh, because, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear. According to him, he bowed to pressure from outside and decided to teach some people, his sons, a number of family members, and others, and opened what is now the A.T. Still University in Kirksville at that time, the American School of Osteopathy. The first college of osteopathic medicine in the world was opened in Kirksville in 1892. And there it is. The first mother church, you might say, of osteopathy or osteopathic medicine as we call it today. And that's A.T. Still sitting on the porch. Obviously, things have changed a lot since 1896. Well, with the success of the American School of Osteopathy in the 1890s and with graduates um, starting to number in the several hundreds, graduates began to try to establish their own schools, which leads us to our predecessor institution, the S.S. Steele College and Infirmary of Osteopathy. I'm not going to say that all through any longer. S-S-S-C-I-O. Okay? And this was founded by these folks along with others. Summerfield, Saunders Still, and Ella Still, along with others, were the founding physicians of this institution. And it was named, of course, after Summerfield Still. And I'm sure that it was named had still in the name because of Andrew Taylor still, because of the fame of osteopathy. What's interesting about this, and something I didn't really know until I researched it a little more deeply, is that the reason why we're here today is because a businessman from Akron, Ohio, had a stroke. What happened was this. This guy... Colonel Arthur Conger was a prominent, prominent person in this country in the late 19th century. He lived in Akron, Ohio. 
He was a Civil War veteran. He was a colonel in the Civil War. He was on a business trip. Uh, he had no connection to Iowa. He was on a business trip in Boston, and he had a stroke. And he was paralyzed along his right side. And he said in his memoir, Colonel Conger, that all of the prominent physicians that he had consulted in Boston had told him there was nothing they could do for him. Having heard of A.T. Still, he got on a train and went to Kirksville. He was met at the station by A.T. Still and his assistant. And he told Dr. Still what had happened. And he said, they tell me there's a blood clot in my brain. Are you going to scrape it out? And A.T. Still supposedly said to him, that's not osteopathy. What we're going to do is restore the blood flow and see if we can improve you. Well, apparently, Colonel Conger made a rather exemplary recovery. He was so impressed there in Kirksville that he offered to buy the American School of Osteopathy. The Still family said, no, no way, Jose, we're not selling. And he said, well, fine. And so he came up here and founded this one. Now, he had some help, obviously. He got to know Summerfield Still and Ella Still while he was in Kirksville being treated. Summerfield was on the faculty there, and so was Ella. And he spoke with them and said, you know, would you like to found another one of these wonderful institutions that has done so much good for so many people, and they agreed. My guess is, there's no information to support my guess, but my guess is that he probably provided most of the financial support for the founding of the S.S. Still College. He was rich, they weren't. I mean, kind of an easy thing to think of. They came up here. Why would they come to Des Moines from Kirksville? Well, in 1900, Des Moines was a bustling metropolis here in the Midwest. 60,000 was the population of this city then. It had five or six railroads passing through, daily trains, an interested population, active businessmen. Uh, and so it seemed like an excellent place to Colonel Conger to begin a school. Summerfield Still <coughs> was A.T. Still's nephew. Summerfield's father was James Still, who was A.T.'s older brother. James Still had an M.D. degree. He had attended Rush Medical College in Chicago. And he practiced in eastern Kansas. Summerfield grew up in eastern Kansas, attended Baker University, which is not far from Lawrence. And actually, Baker University was founded by A.T. Still and his father, Abram, giving the land for that college to exist. That college is still there, still a Methodist institution, the oldest four-year institution in Kansas. He also went to Kansas University and uh, eventually to the American School of Osteopathy, where he graduated in 1895. Some of the records say that his wife graduated the same year. Some say that she graduated the year after. But whatever happened, he graduated and was sent to Chicago for a series of anatomy lectures to learn anatomy and became the anatomist at ASO. He taught the students the anatomy. And that's what he was doing there when Colonel Conger came to town. A.T. Still said about Summerfield Still, that he was the finest anatomist he ever knew. He said that while he was on the faculty. He might have taken that back a few years later, as I'll come to. In any event, Summerfield became the president of this institution, or the predecessor, in 1898 when it was formed. Doors opened in September of 1898, and he was president until 1905 when there was a change in ownership and governance. 1898 is an important year in Iowa because that was the year that the Osteopathic Practice Act was passed that allowed DOs to be licensed and to practice in this state. And that was how they were able to open the college. Here's the first permanent building. There was a temporary building that was close to this, but this one was the permanent building uh, down on Locust, 1422 Locust, which is just across the street from the sculpture garden downtown that you've seen. 
If you know where the radio station, KRNT or whatever that radio station is along there, approximately there was where this school sat. You can see this is uh, about 1905, maybe. The reason I say that, there's a horseless carriage in front of the building. Across the street was what has been called the first osteopathic hospital. Now, Kirksville had an infirmary, but they didn't have an overnight stay facility. This one was not an overnight stay facility either, originally, but a few years later, they added some overnight beds and called it a hospital. This was originally Colonel Conger's residence. He lived across the street from the school, and after he died, it became the infirmary in 1899. This is in the middle of where the sculpture park is today, just across the street. Well, <clears throat> those early years for colleges of osteopathic medicine were turbulent, uh, to say the least. There were a lot of schools that were formed, went defunct, were absorbed, etc. This school was in that danger because of financial issues and so forth. But early on, absorbed two other osteopathic colleges that had been formed in 1902, and in turn, the assets of this school were purchased by the American School of Osteopathy in 1903 and 1904. And in 1905, this institution was actually part of the American School of Osteopathy, the Kirksville School. And in fact, some of the diplomas in 1905 from here are signed by Andrew Taylor still, who was still alive at the time. However, word got out that the American School of Osteopathy in Kirksville was going to close the Des Moines School and move everything to Kirksville. And as they say, uh, something hit the fan. Because what happened then was the students rebelled and said, we're not, we don't, you know, we're going to form our own school if you do that. And local business leaders were all up in arms because they thought the school was a benefit and was a, an important part of the Des Moines community. And so after a lot of turmoil over a few months to maybe a year or two, a consortium of Des Moines business leaders purchased this college. They were led by Frederick Hubble, Jr. Frederick Hubble, Sr. is the guy who was behind what is now the principal, Banker's Life, which it was before. Fred Hubble, Jr., of course, was his son and obviously vitally interested in the survival of of this school as an asset to the community. So the business consortium purchased the college in 1905. In 1906, they changed the name to Still College of Osteopathy and Surgery. Well, what happened next? Well, this fellow came along. Some of you know about him, some of you don't. I don't want to go into great deal, detail about Abraham Flexner himself, but let me just tell you a bit about what happened. The Carnegie Foundation hired him to do a survey of medical education in the United States. The reason was many people felt that early 20th century medical education in this country was substandard, and in point of fact, they were correct. It was. So he was hired to survey medical schools. But he said, look, it doesn't matter, you know, if they're uh, people who use drugs, allopathic physicians, or if they're non-drug therapy folks, osteopathic physicians, because look, you still have to find out what's wrong, which means that the process you go through, taking a history, doing a physical examination, obtaining whatever laboratory testing you might need to do, there's, that's what you have to do regardless of whether you're going to treat it with drugs or with manipulation or other methods. So he uh, surveyed osteopathic colleges as well. I'm not sure that the osteopathic colleges thought that was beneficial at the time because Flexner was exceptionally critical of all U.S. medical education in that first decade of the 20th century. He wrote of the medical schools in Iowa, none is satisfactory. The medical department of Drake University, yes, they used to have a medical school, 
and the homeopathic department of the state university. Yes, there used to be a homeopathic school in Iowa City. Are well-intentioned but feeble. There was a private medical school in Sioux City. He damned them out of hand. And he said about the still college, the osteopathic school in Des Moines should be summarily suppressed. Everything about the school indicates that it is a business. Uh, that emphasis is mine, not his, but you can just hear him saying it. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't exempt medical education centers like Chicago, one of the near ones. There were 14 medical schools there in those days, and look what he said about them. Indescribably foul. A, the plague spot of the nation. I mean, <laughs> I don't know how you could have gotten any worse criticism. And to their everlasting credit, medical educators took all of this to heart. Medical education began to change after the Flexner Report, and it changed here, too. It changed in part because of Flexner and the recognition that there needed to be higher standards and also the recognition that perhaps, just perhaps, we ought to teach more than we do or did in osteopathic schools. Well, so, Summerfield Still was the first president of the predecessor of this institution, and that's mostly why he's important. Without him, probably we wouldn't have had a school here. Of course, if Arthur Conger hadn't had a stroke in Boston, we might not either. But let me talk to you now about our third president, Simeon Taylor. Simeon Taylor is a fellow who some of you may know the name. Some of you may have read some things about him as president of this uh, institution's predecessor. But here are a few more details about this outstanding president. He was a Unitarian minister. He was at a pulpit in uh, Illinois, and he heard about osteopathic medicine. He moved to Des Moines and attended this school and got his D.O. degree in 1903. That was when Summerfield was still here. He uh, then got an M.D. degree at the University of Nebraska a few years later. And after he had that degree, he moved to Baltimore and did postgraduate training at Johns Hopkins under an exceptionally famous surgeon whose name was William Halstead. A quick digression about Halstead. Halstead was and is perhaps one of the most titanic figures in the history of surgery. If, if, if any of you who do surgery or put on rubber gloves for, for a sterile technique, this is the man who's responsible for that. He's the guy who brought sterile technique into the surgical suite, aseptic sterile technique. Rubber gloves, gowns. No masks yet, no caps yet, but those things. And that was William Halstead who trained our third president. He came back, Dr. Taylor came back to Des Moines to practice general surgery. And after the Flexner Report, when things were looking kind of bleak for medical education, the business leaders here in town, I, this is nothing but speculation on my part, but I think the business leaders here in town said, well, yeah, it is a business, and we don't know much about it. And they began, to, I think, to shop around. And Simeon Taylor and a group of other physicians from here, osteopathic physicians from Des Moines, got together, purchased the college, and turned it into a nonprofit in 1911. Before 1911, it was a business for profit. After that, it has never been. He renamed, or his, during his administration, the school renamed the Des Moines Still College of Osteopathy in 1911, the same year that it was reorganized as a non-profit entity. A few years earlier, the college had purchased a hospital over on the east side of Des Moines, and that hospital had been renamed Des Moines General Hospital, which was then, and since it was owned by the college, became 
what has been called the Second College Hospital. Des Moines General was a Seventh-day Adventist institution before it was purchased, and it was called the Iowa Sanitarium. So it began as a hospital even before the osteopathic profession acquired it. He also established, Dr. Taylor, the Taylor Clinic there, comprised of around a half a dozen osteopathic physicians. His wife, Lola, was a gynecologist. His brother was an ear, nose, and throat specialist. Simeon Taylor did surgery, and uh, they added a lot of clinical expertise to the osteopathic profession at that time. More importantly, though, Simeon Taylor provided a lot of things. He added the study of Materia Medica. For those of you who don't speak Latin, that's pharmacology. This was roundly opposed by members of the osteopathic profession. There was a great battle that went on in the early 20th century between what were called the broad osteopaths and the lesion osteopaths. The lesion osteopaths were very conservative. They said, look, you can take care of anything you need to take care of by manipulative medicine and appropriate regimen in your life. You don't need any of those toxic drugs. But what they were discounting at the time was the idea that there were a lot of things that weren't toxic. By that part of the century, early 20th century, therapies for various kinds of ailments were becoming not only less dangerous, but also more effective. Examples include things like serums for uh, various kinds of problems, like, uh, you know, immunization. Smallpox immunization was available at that time, but uh, originally A.T. Still was opposed to that kind of thing. A.T. Still argued strongly, strongly, strongly against the use of drugs. One of his last quotes was, keep it pure, boys, don't change the profession. But on the opposite side of the fence was Simeon Taylor, the Little John brothers in Chicago, uh, A.T. Still's grandson, George, who was Summerfield Still's son and had assumed a role, uh, he was a general surgeon as well, had assumed a role in Kirksville. They all spoke strongly that you have to use some of these drugs. They are effective. Why would you close your mind to this? Well, Simeon Taylor and the leaders, other leaders of the profession, the AOA mandated the teaching of Materia Medica. Simeon Taylor was a driving force behind that in our profession. During his term, this term of study for a DO degree lengthened to four years in 1916. At that time, The Philadelphia College, the Chicago College, and this college were the only ones that had a four-year curriculum. It became, obviously, uh, the norm not too many years after that. Dr. Taylor was president for 15 years and resigned in 1926 due to ill health and moved to California. Now, I don't know what his ill health was, but it's interesting to speculate. In those days, pre-antibiotics... People moved to the southern dry part of the country because of tuberculosis, usually. They moved to Arizona, California, places like that. I don't know that he had tuberculosis. I don't know that at all. But supposedly he was in too ill health to practice and had to move. He settled in Santa Monica. And records from the 30s and 40s indicate that he was listed as a physician and that he apparently practiced, and he eventually died in Santa Monica in 1954. Simeon Taylor was perhaps, I don't know if greatest, but one of the great presidents of this institution. Just a bit about Des Moines General. I mentioned it a minute ago. Howard Graney, some of you knew Howard. Howard is gone now, but Howard was a general surgeon here in town. He was, at one time, the national inspector for osteopathic hospitals. This is Des Moines General Hospital as it was. This building burned in the 1960s. But uh, this hospital opened 
as the Still College Hospital. And then in 1916, it was purchased by S.L. Taylor and renamed Des Moines General. It was considered by some, Howard Graney being one of them, as the first osteopathic hospital in the world. Very first one was in this city. That was worthy of the name, at least. It became a non-profit institution in the 1930s and trained hundreds, thousands of physicians and eventually was sold in 2000 and is now, unfortunately, closed. Let me come to this man, whom I bet very few of you know of. I can see that some of you either knew of him or knew him. Uh, I didn't. He was gone before I came to town. But I consider him one of the great presidents of this institution as well. John P. Schwartz, or most people, I think, called him J.P., although <laughs> the students here called him Pinky. I don't think they called him Pinky to his face. That'd be my guess. They wouldn't have called this man. He had red hair. I think that's why they called him Pinky. Some people called him Red, I'm told, too. And it, doesn't he look dapper, you know? This is in the days when men used hair oil, you know. But <clears throat> he came to town in 1919. He was a graduate of the American School of Osteopathy in Kirksville. He came here for surgical training. And he trained at Des Moines General under S.L. Taylor before Dr. Taylor left town. By 1921, a couple of years after he finished school, he was teaching embryology, bacteriology, and surgery here. That's the way it used to work, you know. If they thought you could teach something, they'd give you three or four things to teach. You'd be a part-time professor and practicing across town and doing all these things. In 1926, when S.L. Taylor retired and left town, the guy who was the dean here moved up to the presidency place, and uh, Pinky <laughs> was uh, uh, moved up to become dean. He remained dean here from 1926 to at least 1941 or 42. The data is not entirely clear. While practicing surgery and while being chief of staff at Des Moines General. But what is important about him, besides the fact that he was dean for so long, is that during World War II, probably more than any other individual, J.P. Schwartz is responsible for the survival of this institution. For this institution even surviving is probably owing to the efforts of this man. Let me bore you with a little more osteopathic history. We're coming to the university, I promise. In, the, um, in World War II, when it broke out, many osteopathic physicians wanted to enlist and practice as medical officers in the Army. They had been denied that during World War I, and were not allowed to practice as physicians. They could be hospital stewards. They could be combat infantrymen. They'd be anything but a doctor in the military. They were, they were determined this wouldn't happen to them in World War II. And they even went to President Roosevelt. And they said, can you do anything about this? And he actually, President Roosevelt actually came out in favor of that. And the Army and the American College of Surgeons and a few other entities said, no chance, no way. Jose. And so the DOs were not drafted. The MDs, those poor guys, got drafted into the army and sent off to Bataan or somewhere. The DOs were actually exempted as a strategic resource and stayed home, unless they, of course, went in as an infantryman or something. And what did that do? A couple of things. The first was it, <laughs> it worked the DOs to the bone because with maybe a third or half of the physicians in the country gone, people still needed health care. People still were getting sick. Somebody had to take care of them, and it fell on to the osteopathic physicians. What that did, too, is that the allopathic physicians' patients who began to see them realized that these are doctors just like the other guys with the different initials. And so it helped the osteopathic profession. But at the same time, it was a it was really a problem for the college. And the reason why was because everybody went to war. Nobody was going to school. In the middle of World War II, in 1943, this school had 42 students. That was the lowest point. 
And then that was graduating two classes a year, one in January, one in June. J.P. Schwartz held this place together. He served as president here from 1941 to 1944 without pay. Keeping the place together, practicing surgery as, and working his fanny off during the rest of his time. In 1944, in the fall, he finally said, look, I just can't do it anymore. He had uh, no more time, no more energy, no more strength. But during his time as president, he added faculty, he expanded the library, he reorganized and remodeled basic science facilities, all the while serving as chief of staff at Des Moines General, doing a full surgical practice, and all of the uh, vicissitudes that that uh, causes. After 1944, he remained chief of staff at Des Moines General, and I showed you that picture, and if you remember, there's a little white frame area to the left. He lived there. He had a contract with Des Moines General that he was allowed to live there for life, and he did. There are some people here in the room who may remember that, who may have found that they ran into Dr. Schwartz in the halls uh, or took care of him when he had problems, as Dr. Pandea says down in front. Um, and he eventually died there in 1972. Although his accomplishments in terms of moving the university forward are not enormous, the fact that he was here and that he served and what he did assured that we're here today. In the 50s, we had a lot of name changes. In the 50s, the Des Moines Still College of Osteopathy, which had become the Des Moines Still College of Osteopathy and Surgery, I skipped a step, uh, became just the College of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery. And for years, for a long, long, long time, if you said to somebody in the country, they'd say, where did you go to school? I went to comps. Oh, Des Moines. They always knew. This was the College of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery. And I'm going to skip forward to more modern times now. <clears throat> Here's a gentleman whom some of you may have heard of, some of you knew, perhaps, I don't know him, he's still alive, and uh, he came here after graduating from the Kirksville College of Osteopathy in 1960. He was president only for a short period of time, but his presidency is important for a lot of reasons. First of all, and this is a fact I didn't really know until I began to study him, he's the first recipient of a master's degree from this institution. First one. That's what he came here for, was to do his master's program. He was a very bright man, from what I'm told. Very opinionated man, also. And let me just set the scene in the 1960s so you understand what happened. In 1962... California Osteopathic Association merged with the California Medical Association. The DOs, the member of the Osteopathic Association, paid $50 and were tendered an MD degree. The stipulation was they could never say that they were DOs. They could not hang any of their DO credentials in their offices. And uh, then, you know, they were just like all the other... MDs in California, supposedly. The rest of the profession was appalled by this. The California Association was the largest component association in the profession at the time. There was also an osteopathic college in L.A., which was converted to an allopathic institution and, in fact, is still there today. It appeared to the osteopathic world that the jig was up, so to say. That is to say that what was uh, going to happen was that the DOs were all going to join the MDs. Everybody's going to be an MD. Everybody's going to be happy. And that would be the end of that. And so why do we have to have osteopathic colleges anymore? Well, Tom Vigorito, I think, and those of you, and there are a few here who knew him, can correct me, but I think he uh, saw that. And he thought, how can we continue as a college? 
if, in fact, you know, they're going to be granting MD degrees. He looked into it, and he recommended that we obtain accreditation through the allopathic pathway and start granting the MD degree. Not, not in place of the DO degree, but alongside as a dual sort of program. There was so much, I don't know, paranoia may be the right word, but there was so much anxiety about this whole process that the Board of Trustees basically handed him his head on a platter and sent him out of town. And so Dr. Vigorito did, in fact, leave the presidency in 1971. He went into a neurology residency and practiced. I think he's retired now, but he's still alive in Arizona. Practiced neurology for a long time in Tucson. The last time I knew he had moved to the Phoenix area, he must be 80 if he's a day, I suppose. I have never met the man. I don't know him. But uh, I have a hunch that his presidency was actually a lot of misunderstanding about where he was trying to go with the college. The reason I bring him up is because many people consider him to be one of the brightest folks who ever walked through here. And that may very well be true. As I said, I've not met him. But his presidency as 10th president also resulted in the arrival of this gentleman in Des Moines. Dr. J. Leonard Asnier came here in 1971 as the replacement for Dr. Vigorito. Many of you, well, at least a certain number of you here, knew Leonard. I knew Leonard as well. And if you ask someone about Dr. Asnier, you'll get a lot of answers. But let me just tell you what I think. First of all, he was an exceptionally visionary human being. He came here to a school that was located just north of downtown on 6th Avenue in a deteriorating facility, big brick building, had a clinic next door which was at least as old as that building, and the building was inadequate. There wasn't enough space. Furthermore, the finances of the institution were what I would call iffy. Um, and the question, again, as happened so many times uh, in that 70-some years um, until Dr. Asner's arrival here is, is this institution actually going to survive? We're going to have to have more students. We don't have enough money. We don't have this. We don't have that. Dr. Asner had been on the faculty at Youngstown State in Ohio and had an academic background. And when he came here, even looking at that deteriorated facility on 6th Avenue, he envisioned a Mayo-like center in Iowa. I've heard him say it myself, and some of you may have too. To that end, he began to look at how to construct that center. How could this be put together? They acquired, the college acquired this campus where we are today in 1972, former Catholic girls' school, which had merged with what is now Dowling out in the west suburbs. This was St. Joseph Academy. Um, they built the university clinic system during that period of time, built the academic center over there on the west end of the campus in 1981, opened the Des Moines University Clinic on the east side of the campus here in 86, and clearly expanded the facilities, improved the visibility of the uh, college along Grand Avenue here, and did a great deal, if that's all he had done, in terms of supporting the university. It wasn't a university then, it was comms. In terms of facilities, students, finance, all of these things. His signal achievement, though, was the establishment of this institution as a health care university. Without the vision of J. Leonard Asner, that might not have happened. I mean, you know, there are people who say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We were graduating students, you know. Uh, they were going where they wanted to go, taking care of patients, and so forth and so on. 
The University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences established in 1981 by the addition of two sister colleges to the big sister comms. Interestingly, that makes this year the 30th anniversary of our university. It's amazing that we haven't said much about that. As I thought about this, I thought, gosh, how about that? The 30th anniversary. We were, as far as I know, the first freestanding healthcare university in the osteopathic profession. The other uh, schools, Midwestern University in Chicago, Western University in California, all these others followed suit for U UOMS, or University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences. The programs that were added to the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences were in three colleges, still are, the College of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery, now just called the College of Osteopathic Medicine. We dropped the surgery a few years ago. The College of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery. And the College of Biologic Sciences, which is now the College of Health Sciences. And let me talk to you about each of these sister colleges a little bit. Because I, I'm telling you, in 30 years, they have made an enormous, enormous reputation nationally. Let me talk to you about CPMS first. Our College of Podiatric Medicine and Surgery was the sixth in the United States. There are nine now, maybe even more than that, that have been established, and a couple of them at osteopathic-based health sciences universities. <coughs> CPMS was the first podiatric medical school attached or associated with a healthcare university in the world, and was the first that shared the curriculum with the medical students. Now, I think that's done in several places, but they were the first. First 30 students enrolled, 1982, graduated 1986. But more importantly, CPMS has what I think is really not very well appreciated as an exemplary record. Look at this. Their students score routinely higher than the national average on board exams. That may sound like, oh, yeah, big deal, five points. No, 15 to 20 points above the rest of their colleagues on national board exams. An amazing feat, if you think about it. In June 11, they had a 100% pass rate on their boards. First time. Take it the first time pass. You know. There's active research ongoing and continues and has built a real reputation for scientific scholarship among the faculty of our sister college. Graduates have been accepted into prestigious residency programs nationwide. And now there are more than a thousand graduates who are active in, a, I don't know if it's all states of the union, but nearly. They've done an amazing job in a short period of time. The College of Health Sciences initially began with a bachelor's program in physician assistant studies. They also, the first graduating class, received a certificate as a physician assistant. And they graduated in 83, that first class. There was also a Master of Science degree in healthcare administration that was initially given. And that first class graduated in 86. But now, there are four programs. The physician assistant program now is a master's program. The majority of their alumni, uh, more than half, I think, practice here in the state. Uh, they made a contribution to health care here just by that fact alone. The, uh, the physical therapy program began as a master's degree program and is now a doctoral program, doctor of physical therapy. They also have another program which they don't have listed here called a post-professional doctoral degree where the ones who have a master's in physical therapy can attend and, and work on a doctoral program. The Master of Healthcare Administration, or MHA degree now, used to be MS. Many of the alumni of that program work in healthcare organizations here in the state and elsewhere, some of them quite highly placed in Iowa Health and in the Mercy System and in others. And the Master of Public Health program, which began in 1999, uh, initially as part, uh, along with the healthcare administration degree, as part of the Div Division of Health Care Management, I think it was called. Uh, has been separated and is part of its own program, and this Master of Public Health program continues to grow as well. 
Well, so now we come to a fellow who you might run into today. He's around here somewhere, I'm told. Richard Ryan came here as president in 1996 uh, after the departure of Dr. Asnier. Dr. Ryan, uh, uh, many of you probably knew or were around. I knew him fairly well, know him fairly well. He's not dead. And here are his credentials. He has a Doctor of Science degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. Subsequently, he was Associate Dean for Medical Services, the Harvard Medical School, then became Dean for Hospital and Faculty Affairs, the Tufts School of Medicine in Boston. Uh, He was eminently qualified by his education and by his experience and became the 13th president here at the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences in 1996. During the Ryan years, we had our final, I hope, name change. I have a hard time keeping track of all those names. Uh, We became Des Moines University in 1999, at the same time that the MPH program began. During the Ryan years, the Human Performance Lab opened over in the clinic. Research space was increased by the expansion of the Science and Education Building, which is now Ryan Hall. Planning for this building, where we are right now, began. The physician assistant program and the physical therapy programs both offered more advanced degrees. And we began to obtain some national recognition, in part because Dr. Ryan knew everybody in Boston, just about. And I think we began to be noticed by institutions back east. And we became what we are today... At last, Des Moines University. Des Moines University today will be, or not today, tomorrow, will be inaugurating our 15th president. And just for a moment, I want to talk about the immediate predecessor, Terry Branstad. I think many of you either knew or spent some time talking to uh, Governor Branstad. He was, as you know, four-time governor before he became um, president of this institution. He was a graduate of, he is a graduate of the University of Iowa and of the Drake Law School. And during his presidency, just finished, scholarship funds here tripled. Amazing. The Student Education Center, this building, was opened and unified the campus. Some of us who are older remember having to walk across the street and pass three or four houses that used to be over there, and the campus was here and there and over there and just well, it finally became unified. The, there were a couple of other master's programs that were added in COM. Master of Science in Anatomy and Master of Science in Biomedical Sciences. And those programs have been exceptionally successful and continue to be. The MSA, the Master of Science in Anatomy program in particular, is an, uh, an amazing idea and one that I think others will take up because... One of the things that's happening these days is very few people are being graduated with degrees in anatomy. Anatomy professors are tough to find because they're they're not being made. So we're training them here. And biomedical science, of course, is important. And there are other things. I couldn't put them all on the slide. The Iowa Simulation Center opened in 2007 and uh, continues to be uh, something that generates a lot of wow factor for visitors who come here, and they see what these simulators can teach these students. So, to sum up then, this university began pretty humbly. And there have been a lot of times, up until perhaps the 1960s, when there was concern about the future and about What could happen, and where are we going to go, and how good or how bad are we? And many of these people that I've talked about today contributed enormously to the success of this Des Moines University. Some of them more than others, but some of them had to do with their placement in history. They just happened to be there, I suppose. But what I can say is that no institution... None can survive without strong leadership. 
It requires both strong leadership and it requires that the those who are led are willing to work to meet the vision that is present there. I think that Dr. Franklin will be inaugurated tomorrow. He's been here already for seven months and is beginning to see, I think, what this institution has been, what this institution can be. I think that Des Moines University is poised on the brink of a really bright future. I think that we are going to see a lot more advances, a lot more progress, and we're going to find that we look back and we say that every time that we've had a president, that president has been the best one for the time. So, I think that's where I'll stop. I ran over five minutes. I apologize. Anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, uh, if I know. If not, I'll refer it to the old guys in front down here who probably know more about it than I do. So, questions? Sir? Thank you. And you. Yeah. But there was a Divine University in the second, Oh, yes. Second and Yes. And my last class graduated in 1937. Mm-hmm. I know that. Thank you for that. And I, you know what I meant to tell that. I don't know if you heard me or, or heard uh, Dr. Pandea here in front. We're not the original Des Moines University. We're the second Des Moines University. There was a Des Moines University that was up at, on, on Euclid, second in Euclid, in the early part of the 20th century, it was a, a church-related institution, I think. But then it was purchased by a man who, uh, the only thing I can say is that fellow must have been crack-brained. Because he had, he had some strange idea about... about Lawsonian. In the, yeah, Lawsonian style, I don't know. Anyway, the, the, the craziness was that uh, he got, the students got so mad at him that they rioted. And he hid under his desk. Did you know this part? He had to hide under his desk. He had away from the students. And they closed after that uh, riot at the original Des Moines University and never reopened in the 1930s, I think. Thank you for telling me. I'd forgotten about that. Any other questions or comments? If not, thanks so much for your attention. It was a real honor. Up here? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know what that program was that he was in, but it was a master's degree program at what was then COMS, the College of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery. That was Dr. Thomas Vigorito. And I, I, I don't know whether it was anatomy or biologic sciences or physiology. It was physiology. Dr. Pandea was here. He would know. So physiology was the master's program. So. Yeah, I know who that is. Other questions? Well, thank you for your attention. I hope it wasn't boring. <laughs>